Welcome everyone to live compiler development with cross-platform tooling. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to give a bit of background about this talk. I originally wanted to just give a general kind of cross-platform tooling talk about all of the tools we've been developing at Microsoft for C++ developers. But, you know, there's so many talks about tools which say, you know, here's feature one, here's feature two, and we'll just walk through why you would want to use them, how they work. And those talks were all fine, but I wanted to actually you know, build something, show how you could use these tools to make an actual application. Uh, so I came up with some goals. My first goal was I wanted to develop a small cross-platform application live. I wanted to target Windows and Linux because you know, we've been doing so much work in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code for supporting targeting Linux. Even if you're developing on Windows, targeting Linux should be just as easy. I also wanted to demonstrate dependency handling because you know, this is such a pain point in C++ at the moment, and there's a lot of different solutions out there. I wanted to talk about one. I also wanted to build something powerful, uh, not just a silly kind of toy application, something where you can actually look at it and say, oh wow, like look at what you can accomplish in an hour with all of these tools. And that's kind of the sticker here. I have an hour to do this all. Um, so I had to think and came back to what I pretty much always end up on, which is building a compiler. Uh, what could possibly go wrong building a compiler in an hour? So welcome to compiler speedrun, 45 minutes, 100%. Let's go. Source language. So a compiler has a source language and a target language. The source language is the, the language which it takes in code from, and then the target language is the language it outputs code in. Usually the source language is a high level language like C or C++ or Java or whatever, and the target language is an assembly language like um, x86 or ARM, or it could be another source language, like you have compilers which will take source language like NIM or even C++ and then translate that to C. That's still a, a compiler. The source language for today is BrainFuck. Uh, this looks ridiculous, but this is actually one of my favorite languages because it is actually a very, very simple model of programming. And it's also Turing complete. So I'm going to go through how BrainFuck works so that you kind of understand what I'm going to be doing with this compiler. So BrainFuck operates on an infinite tape of zeros um, initially. This is all just cells which can go from 0 to 255. Then you have a single pointer which tells you which cell you're currently looking at. And this pointer can move up and down this infinite tape. There are eight instructions in the entire language, and some of them you can probably tell what they do already, such as this instruction. It moves the pointer to the left. So every time the language, the interpreter or the compiler sees this character, it's going to move the pointer one space to the left. Similarly, the right one moves the pointer to the right. Plus, this increments whatever is at the pointer. And the minus sign decrements. See, it looks ridiculous, but it's really not that um, absurd. Slightly more obscure is the, the IO instruction. So comma is read from standard in. So this will read a single character from standard in and write it into uh, where you're pointing. Similarly, dot will then write to standard out. Finally, these two braces are loops. So this will repeat whatever, whatever is within the brackets while the cell we're pointing at is greater than zero. So every time we get to the start of the loop, we check if the cell we're pointing at is zero. And if it is, then we jump to the end. And that's the entire language. So if we, if we have a, a minus sign within these brackets, then we're just going to keep reading down until we get to zero. Uh, if you have any questions about BrainFuck before I move on, feel free to drop them in the, in the Q&A and I'll get to them in a minute. Target language. Our target language is x64, which is the 64-bit variant of, um, of x86 assembly. So 
Uh, I, it's a massive, complex instruction set, so I'm only going to be using a really, really tiny part of it. Um, so I won't try and explain it right now, but as we build the compiler, I'll try and explain the um, the instructions we're using as we go along. And if you have any questions, again, just drop them in, in the q and I'll see them. These are the tools I'm going to be using today. Uh, Visual Studio as my IDE, CMake for uh, building, WSL for targeting Linux, and VZ Package for dependency management. Uh, if you're not using these tools, then this talk is still going to be interesting for you, I hope, either because you'll still be able to apply a lot of the ideas from this talk to your own tools, or because you get to watch me fail to build a compiler in an hour. Take your pick. Here are some alternatives. Um, you might be using VS Code or CLine for IDE, Mison Build 2, so on and so forth. The, a lot of these, um, the concepts that I'm talking about are going to transfer over. Getting started. All right. So I'm going to um, apparently search for something. This is going well. Visual Studio. All right, going to build up Visual Studio. We're going to be using Visual Studio Preview 2019. Um, this is the, the latest version, and we're going to be starting absolutely from scratch, a blank slate as soon as this decides to boot up. Here we go. OK, create a new project. We're going to, as I said, uh, make a CMake project. So Visual Studio comes with its own um, CMake project, which you can just click here. And then we're going to call this shame duck. Hit create, and this is going to build just a really, really basic um, CMake project for us with all we need just to get started coding. Here we go. All right. So now we're in our, our familiar and Visual Studio environment. Down here, I've got um, a developer PowerShell, which I'm going to be using just because it's I'm, I'm building a compile a command line compiler. So this is going to be handy. Just to give you a quick tour of what we're given, this is a basic ZMIC project. We have a single project with a subdirectory. This then has a single executable with a single source file. And I'm just going to get rid of all of this. OK, let's get going. All right, our compiler is going to have three stages. First, we're going to go from our source code to assembly. This is going to be our compile step. Next, we're going to take our assembly and generate an object file from it. The object file is a, um, a binary representation of that assembly. From this object file, we are then going to generate a final executable, which we can run. I'm just going to stub out all of these functions right now. Um, the compile stage is going to be by far the most complex in our compiler because for the assembler and the linker, we're just going to call out to external tools. Uh, we already have an assembler and a linker available, so we're going to use those. Um, as far as I know, Windows does not come with a BrainFuck compiler built in. All right, to start off, we need a couple of files. We're going to need an input file, which has our um, BrainFuck code in it. And we're going to have a output file which has, which is going to store our assembly. Um, you might see already that I'm getting some red squiggles in the IDE because I haven't include, I haven't included the the necessary header. If I hit Control Dot, I actually get a little prompt here which can add it for me. It's just one of those those nice little things in in Visual Studio. Okay, so as I said, BrainFuck is just a big sequence of instructions. So every single instruction, every single character has one meaning. So what we can do is have a single character and loop while we have something in our input stream. We're going to read into the character, and then we're going to switch over whatever this character is. I remember our instructions are right, left, plus, minus, comma, dot, and loop. If I want to quickly just bash out uh, some case statements here, I can use uh, Visual Studio's multi character editing, which you just hold shift and alt, then you can move around and um, just makes this a little bit nicer. Oops. 
Okay. And I can have a default case. And brainfuck, if you read something which is not one of these characters, it's just a comment. So we're just going to break. Right, now we can get started on our compiler. So if we want to move the pointer right, remember that we have an infinite tape of zeros and a pointer. This pointer needs to move around. We need to store it somewhere. And the best place to store it will be in a register. So I'm going to store this in R12. But if we want to add one to R12, we say add R12 one. This is an x86 instruction. Add is the instruction. R12 is the destination. And one is our immediate value, which we're adding. Hopefully that is not too confusing. Very similarly, if we want to move it to the left, we just subtract and add to sub. Again, any x86 questions which are relevant, please drop them in q and I'm not an x86 expert, but there are probably people who are. So, you know, if you have a, um, a more complex question, feel free to answer that, ask that as well. If we want to increment what's through the pointer, then we need to dereference it. That is done by saying how much we want to dereference. So if we want to treat it as you know, a char or an int or, or a long or whatever, and just adding some brackets around the register here. We can do that here. And those are our four, first four instructions already done. Now, I said that we wanted to target Windows and Linux. Uh, so far, I haven't really done any anything like that. I can build this for Windows because um, you know, if I hit Shift Control B, then ooh, it's going to say I have an unexecutable. Oh, put this executable instead of link. There we go. Uh, if I build this, then this is going to build me a Windows executable because um, by default we're targeting x64 Windows on CMake, but I want to target Linux. And to do that, we're going to use WSL. OK, WSL. WSL stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux. It lets you install Linux distributions easily. Now, note that this is Linux distributions. This isn't like Sigwin, where you, know, you have a Windows environment, and you have a bash shell, and then you have all of the kind of nightmares which come with path mismatches and um, the package manager not having what you want, or all of these kinds of things. These are literal Linux distributions. Like you're installing Ubuntu or Mint or, or Arch or whatever. You can run Bash shell scripts and Linux command line applications like pretty much anything which you're used to. You know, if you want to use Tmux or any of the, the programming languages which are available on Linux or any, any of the services, SSH clients, things like that. They're all there. Uh, my favorite thing is being able to install additional software using the Linux package managers. Um, like Windows is getting its own package manager, which is nice, but the Linux package managers are just really, really wonderful. Um, I'm particularly fond of Pac-Man and just being able to be in Windows and have Pac-Man available as a tool to use is so powerful. Uh, finally, something which is kind of cool is that you can invoke your normal Windows applications using your Unix-like shell. So if you're like me and you come from primarily Linux background and you're absolutely useless using PowerShell or CMD, then you can do all your Windows-y stuff just in Bash, uh, which can make life a lot easier. If you want to install WSL, then you just run this single uh, PowerShell command and then you can install any distribution you like from the Microsoft Store. There's a bunch of officially supported ones, and then there's others which people have made unofficially, and you can find, I don't know, on the dark web somewhere. Another cool thing is that WSL2 is now generally available. So if you're at the, you don't have to be on the Windows Insider program anymore. If you have an up to date version of Windows, Windows 10, then you can get WSL2. Now, the difference between WSL1 and WSL2 are, are these. So they both give you a Windows and Linux integration. They're both really fast to boot up and have small resources, resource footprint. 
Um, the interesting thing is WSL1 was not a full VM. Uh, WSL2 actually is a VM. Uh, it's not the kind of VM experience you're used to. Like I said, small resource footprint, fast boot times, but it is a VM and it does have a full Linux kernel in it. Um, as a result, the, the WSL2 gives you um, compatibility for more applications because if something like really, really needs a Linux kernel, then you need a Linux kernel. Uh, it also gives you better file system performance um, inside the Linux environment. So if you if you try and read something out in the Windows environment from WSL2, you don't get the the same performance. But generally, the file system performance will be will be better on WSL2. One question here is: Does WSL require Hyper-V to run? At work, we are only allowed to have one of VirtualBox or Hyper-V to be installed at once. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that myself. Like I said, my experience of WSL is all just you run that um, that command and then install it from um, from the Windows Store. Uh, but if you want to uh, look more into it, the if you go to aka.ms/wsl, then you can get to all of the WSL documentation. I can also look into it uh, later if you like. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, WSL2 will have way better file system performance inside the Linux environment, but not necessarily out of that. Okay, so I'm now going to try and target WSL from, um, from here. I have already installed Ubuntu. If I boot up here, you can see it's already there. It's pretty fast. And it is an entire Ubuntu installation. I can run LS, I can run APT, I can you know, run Vim, if I can type Vim. <laughs> it even tells me I don't have Vim because I typed it wrong. I can even run Kase. Yay. So yeah, anything you're used to on um, on Ubuntu is going to be right here. Now, if I want to target it, you might be used to a uh, configuration experience where you know you have to set up a SSH daemon and uh, set up all the ports yourself and things like that. But this is actually way easier than that. I just go into my configurations, I hit the plus button, scroll down to WSL right at the bottom here, click it, save, and we're done. If you want any other configuration options, those are all available in this uh, this editor here, or you can edit the, the JSON files yourself. But that's literally it. You add a configuration, and now you'll see that this is CMake going off and doing all of its Linuxy stuff. It's, uh, oh no, this is still targeting Windows. If I switch over here, then we should see CMake doing its Linuxy stuff. So it found the, um, if I find my VC package installation, which I have in um, in my Linux distribution, which we'll get to later, and you can see that this is using uh, GCC 7.4, and it's all just worked out this by itself. I did not have to do any sneaky, sneaky configuration before I started this talk. It's all just done. And now if I hit Control Shift B, then it's going to build my Linux version. And there we go, build and linked. And if I go to x64 one, then it's going to flip and I can build my Windows version. And that is built. Yes, there we go. OK, now if I go back to my uh, PowerShell, I can actually drop straight into WSL by just typing WSL. And now I'm in Ubuntu, right where I was. It's really nice. So if I want to run my, um, if I want to run my applications, which I just built, they're going to be an out build slash, and then you see we've got a WSL folder and a Windows folder. So I can go ahead and run the Linux version, and that has generated an empty assembly. Oh, because I didn't copy in my Right, I already have a brainfuck um, Hello World program, which I 
put away earlier. This is what it looks like. Don't try and understand it. It's it's Hello World. Just trust me. So now that I have a Hello.bf in here, I can run my compiler. And I've just run a Linux application from the command line in Windows, which I built on Windows targeting WSL. And it's now generated me some assembly. And like I said earlier, I can I don't just I'm not just able to run the, the Linux version here. I can also run the Windows version, shimduck.exe, and that gives me the same output. And if you don't believe me that these are different, I can run file on them. You know, it's the win the Linux one is an L file for Linux, and the Windows one is a P32 plus XE for Windows. So these are literally Windows and Linux executables. There's no hidden like sneaky magic here. It's it's all good. Right, now that we've got Windows and Linux targeting ready, we can go ahead and do some more of our compiler. Now, IO is a little bit more complicated. Like we could just do all of this with system calls. On Linux, that would be kind of reasonable. On Windows, they're they're undocumented, and this would be a nightmare. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and um, call out to libc. If I call getchar, then this is going to um, call the libc getchar, which I'll link against later, and it's going to put the um, the result into the AL register. And I want to put this into where we're pointing R12. So this will get our character from AL and move it into this location here. Similarly, if I want to put oh, if I want to put a character to stood out, then I'm going to move into CL the um, currently being pointed at. CL is just where the calling conventions are going to expect this argument to be. And then I'm going to call pitchar. I'm just going to double check this because that could go wrong. Looks good. All right. Um, so that is our IO instructions. We're going to call getchar and we're going to call pitchar. Feel free to ask any questions about uh, these instructions you like. And now we're going to do loops. So loops are a bit more complicated. So remember, we've got our sequence of instructions, and we can have a loop anywhere in here. Now how the loops are implemented, if we're going along executing these instructions, and we get to here. First, we check if what we're pointing at is 0. And if it is, we jump past the end of the loop. If it's not, then we're going to execute all this code and then jump back to the start. Now, another problem is that these things can be nested. So we need to be able to match up these braces and implement all of this in assembly. So what we're going to do is we're going to use labels to implement these, these jump points. Labels in assembly just to use, essentially mark a point in your code where you can jump to. And I have a question saying, on Linux, the function argument should go in RDI, shouldn't it? Um, yes, I'm going to get that to that later. Uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm glossing over it at the moment, hoping no one will notice and someone notice. Uh, anyway, yeah, so these things can be nested. Um, so yeah, we're going to use assembly labels, which allow you to just jump around your code. And we're going to use a stack to uh, make sure that we match all of these things up. So if we go ahead and make a stack, whoa, not that, of integers for our labels, and then our current label will be zero. So our labels are just going to be label number start and end. And we can go ahead and ask our ID to include stack again for us. starting on our loops. So the first thing we want to do is put down a label so that we can jump back to the start of the loop when we need to. And that's going to look like 
label, current label, start. And we need to perform our check. So remember, we check if we're pointing at zero. And if we are, then we're going to jump past the end. So we're going to use the compare instruction. We're going to compare what's stored, what's pointed at by R12 to zero. And if it is zero, then we're going to jump. That's what JZ means. And we're going to jump to label, current label, end. And then in order to do our matching, remember, we need to keep track of our stack of labels so we can match them up. So we're going to do labels.push, uh, current label, and current label. Uh, note one cool thing which happened here when I typed in .push, we actually got a list of, um, of members which had stars on them. This is actually guided by uh, machine learning. This is called IntelliCode. Essentially, we trained um, a model on a ton of open source projects, and it will recognize what kind of context you're in and suggest which methods will be most likely to be used here. So in this situation, it's saying, oh, you're probably most likely to use pop or empty or push or top, and this will actually improve as we go along. Um, I've got another comment. Comma might be missing after label. Um, no, because, um, or a space, um, no, because this is going to be, this label is going to look like label zero start or label one start in our assembly. And this is kind of a problem I'm going to be getting to later of IO streams code is really, really not nice to understand. And I'm going to address some of that later. That should do for our opening brace. For our closing brace, we need to remember when we get here, we need to jump all the way back to our our original label. So we're gonna do a unconditional jump, which is the JMP instruction to label labels.top start. And then we need to put in our end label so that we can match up these which is going to be label, labels dot top, end. In order to keep track of our labels in our stack, we are going to pop the, the top of the stack once we're done here. Now, this is essentially the entire body of our, of our brainfuck code. This is, this is going to do the equivalent of any brainfuck code that we feed it in, uh, in about, what's this, like 30 lines of code? It's pretty cool. I do have some problems with this, though. One is the, the problem I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago of this code is really not nice to read at all. Like We've got these chevrons everywhere. Um, people didn't understand if there should be a space here or not because it's unclear what this is actually supposed to be. It would be way nicer if we had like a Python style formatting library or something. And fortunately, one is actually coming in C20 with um, with FormatLib. It's a really, really nice um, like Python style formatting library for C20 for C. Um, I don't have the um, an implementation of C20 with FormatLib right here. But I do have um, VC package installed. And I have another question which says, shouldn't the jump on the closing bracket be conditional? No, the jump shouldn't be conditional because this is when we get rid of this. Uh, the jump shouldn't be conditional. We're always doing the check here. Um, and if we are not pointing to zero, then we're going to read all the way here. And then we're going to jump back. And then we're going to do the check again before we do the loop. So the check is always at the start, and then we jump back at the end. Yep, so I don't have format lib installed right now, um, but I do have VC package. And what VC package lets me do is if I go to my CMake lists and I type find package, and I get a big list 
of all of the things which are installed in, which are available in VC package. I think I saw catch two, which is, um, you know, made by Phil who runs the conference, which is kind of cool. And I also have format. So it's a format library for C++, safe alternative to printf, really nice. It also gives me the, the CMake invocations I need for it. Now, if I go ahead and say, I require format lib, then this is going to go away and CMake is going to shout at me because I don't have this installed. But if I just go ahead and hit control dot, then I can install format lib from on VC package. And now in my output window, this is getting VC package and building it from source and then installing it in a known location. So while that goes off, I'm going to talk a bit more about VC package. So VC package is a open source um, project developed on GitHub. It's a package manager for C and C++ libraries. It runs on Win Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So it's a, a cross-platform package manager. It's not just a Windows thing. The repository, uh, repository currently contains over a thousand packages and there's more um, pretty much every single day. Packages have been contributed not just by Microsoft, but also by the community. So if you have your own open source project, which you'd like in the VC package um, repository, then you can just issue a PR or an issue. PRs are better because then we don't have to do it. Uh, we're pretty fast in merging PRs. So um, yeah, if you do have any packages which are not in VC package and you'd like, please let us know. Uh, I've got another question. Isn't there a CMake call that would automatically get the package unless it is already installed? Um, boop, 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 boop. Yeah, you could do something like that. Um, but that would mean building VC package into your CMake, which you may you may want to do and you may not. Um, so that yeah, that would be a valid approach as well. Um, all of, one interesting thing about VC package is all libraries and their dependency chains are tested. So what that means is that if I check out a um, given version of the, the VC package repository, then I can be almost certain that if I pick a ver if I choose a dependency, then that and all of its um, all the projects which that depends on have been tested against each other and are safe to use, at least as far as is guaranteed by their testing. Um, so what this means is you can check out any version of the VC package repository and be pretty much safe. You can export binary packages, although everything is um, sourced by default. Uh, you can build everything like on a on a build server or something, and then distribute all your binary packages to, to all your developers. It does support private libraries, so. Um, you know, if you have your own dependency, internal dependencies, which you don't necessarily want other people to be sniffing around and you don't want to make them open source, then you can just make your own port and keep that locally in your own fork and it will all just work fine. Uh, you can and you should pin your dependency versions, by which I mean you do not want your dependencies being upgraded underneath your feet because that causes problems. So you can, if you check out a given version of VC package, if you do not update that copy of VC package, like if you like the the um, all of the ports are stored in a given directory. So if you do not update that directory, which gives all the meta information about the packages, then none of the packages will ever be updated, um, and that is really really important for like reproducible builds and all that jazz. Some things which are coming soon in VC package. Um, which people have been asking for for a really, really long time is binary caching. Binary caching, because everything's from source, you know, binary caching can save so much time. One thing which um, a lot of people are very, very interested in is manifest files. So if you're if you're coming from like Node or uh, or Rust or something like that, where you can have a text file which describes your dependencies and their versions, then this is essentially our version of that. Um, no, this does mean that you do not get benefits of the fixed tested versions of all the libraries. This is 
you're, you're kind of on your own here. You're saying, I want these versions and please just trust me, I've tested them, they work. And if not, it's my fault. Another thing is package federation. So we currently have one source of truth for all the BC package um, packages, but um, we're thinking of introducing a federation where packages can be stored other places and then federated into a, um, one place where you can you can just grab them from anywhere. And also shipping in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. So currently you have to pull it down from GitHub and all that jazz, but we, we want to ship this in our tools. Any more questions about VC package? Use Q and A. Okay, so hopefully this is all built. Yep, took about a minute to build, and it's helpfully given me those um, those commands again. So if I go ahead and link against format, don't need the header only version. Okay, this should regenerate all the CMake information. And if I go ahead and build, then it should, should all work. Build succeeded, sweet. Okay, so now if I want to use format lib, I'm gonna add my include up here. I misspell include, yes I did. Couple of questions. Is there a multi-configuration on one platform support? Um, if you want to do that, for VC package, you would need to have um, separate uh, VC package installations, uh, which if you're coming from other systems might sound silly, but it's actually uh, a pretty reasonable thing to do with VC package. How does the binary caching work on Linux? There are multiple distros with different libc versions, etc. cetera. Um, I am not sure on that. that this is, as I said, uh, um, kind of future work which we're doing at the moment. So I would uh, keep my eye out for um, for updates on our blog. We do have a post which um, gives a bit of details on our roadmap, which includes some information about binary caching. But we haven't um, we haven't at least um, told everyone else what we're going to do with binary caching yet. Yeah, I'm sure the the team who are working on it uh, know a lot more than I do. So if you, if you want more information, you can always just contact me and I'll put you in touch with the team. Okay, um, I have now included format Ostream. So hopefully if I come down here, yep, I now have format lib with full IntelliSense and everything. But I can now go ahead and change my icky icky IO streams code into pretty, pretty format lib. Like I said, this is kind of Python style. I'm saying that I want the whatever zero argument you give me as a format argument, and I'm going to give it current label. So now I don't have any chevrons. I don't have to split up all my stuff. Um, it's pretty clear what I meant here. I meant label something start as a single token. I didn't want a, a space in here. This is just way better in, in so many ways. Uh, and similarly here, I'm at, oops, all right. Completely chevrons. My favorite part of coding is deleting things. I don't know about you. There's just something very therapeutic about it. There we go. Uh, the last thing I need to format lib is, as was noted earlier, I was a little bit sneaky. And uh, this CL is only the, the Windows um, register. The calling conventions on Windows and Linux are different, and they expect arguments in different registers. So I need to fix this up. I can do that here again, print out. And I'm just going to call this rgreg for now. And up here, I'm going to have an if def in 32. If we're on Windows, then rgreg is going to be cl. And if we're on Linux, then it's going to be dil. Yeah. Okay. 
Oops, our Greg. Um, okay, so that should be all of this done. One other thing I need is, since we have all of this memory, I need to I need to set this up. I need to set up a big stack and I need to zero it all out. And to do that, I need what's called a function prolog. Prolog is essentially a large bit of assembly which goes at the top of any function and you know, sets up the stack, um, saves any registers which need to be saved, all of that stuff. And I'm going to use um, C++ 11 raw string literals, which essentially just mean I don't have to end up adding in all of my, my new lines and things like that. I can just write all of this in line. Okay, so there's a few x86 things going on here and assembly things. Um, my function is gonna be called underscore start. So I need to um, declare that as a label. I'm gonna be calling some libc functions. Um, so I need to declare those as external symbols so that the, um, the linker knows that we need to try and find these somewhere else. I'm going to be calling exit later as well, so I want that. I want to declare that I'm now in my text section, which is where code goes, and then this is now my my function, which is going to be called when our program is is started. We need to set up our stack. Now, this is an infinite tape. Unfortunately, my machine does not have infinite memory. I don't know about yours. Um, so I'm going to just pick something which is infinite enough, like, I don't know, 4,000. This just subtracts 4,000 from the stack pointer, which is going to allocate us 4,000 bytes of memory. Now we need to zero all of this. Fortunately, x86 comes with what's essentially a memset function. And we can call it like this. We say we want to write the byte zero. We want to write it 4,000 times, and we want to start at the stack pointer. Then we call rep stosb. Um, as you'll notice, x64 instructions are really, really easy to pronounce and memorize, and this is a, a sterling example of that. Finally, because we're, we're going to be using R12 as our pointer, we need to initialize our pointer to RSP. Then we need to get a little bit more memory for calling functions. This is called shadow space. It's just something which the, the Windows calling conventions require. Now that's enough for a prologue. If we write it out to our file, that should be all good. Now at the end, we need an epilogue, and this is a lot shorter, don't worry. The epilogue, it, very similarly, is just a uh, but at the end of your function, which you use to restore any other registers or restore the stack pointer, things like that. And we're going to use it to restore our stack pointer and return one from our function. So we just have to add back on that 4,064 bytes, which we, we subtracted earlier. We're going to return zero and call exit. Write that into our file. And this should be good. This should be our entire compile step. So now all that's left is to call out to our assembler and our linker. Uh, I'm going to use um, NASM as my, my assembler because that's supported on both um, Windows and Linux. It's a little bit different on, uh, we need to generate slightly different object files. Um, on Windows and Linux, so we're going to have another if def. We're going to call it to NASM. On Windows, we're going to generate uh, Win64 binary. temp.asm is where our assembly is, and our output is going to be temp.obj. On Linux, this is very similar. However, we just have an elf file, and we're going to call it temp.o because it's just a little bit more idiomatic. Okay. Uh, note one interesting thing is that this version of the, um, the if def has actually been grayed out a little bit because the, the IDE has recognized that um, Win32 is defined to one 
in our current configuration. So we can kind of visually see that we we don't we're not currently compiling this code. If we flip to um, here we go. If we flip to Linux, then the the shading is going to change, and we'll see this up at the top as well, where I have a feeling. Yes, <laughs> I wondered why this shading was wrong earlier, and this pointed me to the fact that I had too many underscores in my if def. So this is you know my IDE actually helping me in live coding, which is always nice. Okay, so that's going to be our um, our assembler. Our linker is a little bit more involved because finding the linker and the um, C library on Windows is actually just kind of a pain. Um, so this is another point where I'm cheating a very, very small amount and I've put the linker and the, the UCRT library into environment variables. So I can now just get them here. Another pain is that using um, std system with um, our linker and all these tools, I just need to have so many quote escapes. It's utterly ridiculous. Like, what on earth is this? This is where our linker is going to go. This is our linker invocation. Um, so I'm going to link uh, an executable for a subsystem console. Entry point is going to be underscore start. Temp.obj is where we stored our object file. Our output, we're going to call it hello.exe. And then we're going to link against our UCRT. And I think that should be enough quote escapes to appease the Windows gods. We'll give it our linker and our UCRT arguments. And that should give us our command, which we need. And then we can call out std system with cmd.cster. And its version is a lot shorter, don't worry. For Linux, we can just call out to system system. LD, we want to link against libc, temp.o is our object file. Hello is our output, and then the last kind of magic -y thing we need to do is give it the 64-bit version of the dynamic loader. It's just one of those things which we have to do to get it to work. And that should, if I'm not mistaken, be it. So if we try and build our Linux version, hit Control-Shift-B, then this should build, building succeeded. And if we switch to our Windows version, then we can build that. We got that nice flip in our if devs again. And ooh, this is, oh, those are just telling me that get env is unsafe. And yeah, I know. So this built both of our compilers. Now we can run our compiler. This has run our um, our Linux compiler, and we can, whoops, I just opened an object file. Please don't break. No, I don't want to open the object file. Go away. Um, yep, so now we can see all of our assembly. This is our, our function prologue and us setting up the stack here. Then this is all our, our code. Note we've got label zero start, um, label one, label two start, and hopefully these should all match up. Label three start, label three end, label four start, label four end, two. Yep, so our stack worked properly. We have like nested loops inside this label two, three and three, four and four, and then two matches up again. So our stack worked, all, worked out fine. And then right at the bottom, we've got our call to exit, our, our little epilogue. Now I can, so I built the Linux version of the compiler and I can build the, right, sorry, I've built the program, the Hello World program out of the BrainFuck code on Linux using the Linux compiler. And now I can use the Windows one. Okay, and now I've got Hello and Hello. BF. Now, if I'm feeling really, really brave, I can actually try and run both of these oops, at the same time. And if everything has gone very, very well, and I've not made a single typo in that, 
um, program, then this will print out hello world, hello world. What do we think? Let's go. It worked. Oh my God, first time. Hello world, hello world. And that is a compiler built in just, uh, just over 50 minutes with additional explanations. All right. Uh, so I have some resources which you can go and look at later. Uh, there's the VC package um, repository at the top, um, instruction for WSL, some information about our CMake support because we've been working really, really hard on that and targeting WSL, like getting that experience to just create a, um, a new configuration and suddenly target Linux is really, really nice. I've also linked the effective CMake talk by Daniel Pfeiffer, which I just really, really like and want you to all watch because if everyone just writes CMake nicely, then it makes my life and everyone else's life so much easier. So please do that. Please go and watch this talk. And also Robert Schumacher's talk on, um, on writing packageable libraries. Um, so I'll take any more questions, but that has been live compiler development with cross-platform tooling. Thank you very much. I'll wait for, what is it, 30 second delay or whatever for any questions to roll in. You can also just put in Q&A, congratulations on, on getting it to work first time because, because that was nice. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, um, oh, this talk was awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. All right, uh, I'm gonna end up there. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.